Hello, hello, this is Alex Burkett, and you're listening to The Long Game Podcast. What follows is a live fireside chat between me and Jay Akunzo that happened at our recent Road to Mastery Summit. Jay is a powerful voice in the marketing industry, and really, he's an evangelist for creativity, bravery, and releasing yourself from the gravitational pull of mediocrity, and instead choosing to ship great work. He worked on content at HubSpot, as well as Next View Ventures, and today he's an author of the great book, Breaking the Wheel, show host of the Unthinkable Podcast, and brand consultant. Without further ado, here is my conversation with Jay Akunzo. What's up? Hey, good How to see you? you. Good to see you. It's been a minute. A little bit. And a shout out to your podcast. Um, I've made a lot of shows. I've been on some shows. It was one of the most excellent interviews I've ever been a part of. No, no lie. Not blowing smoke. Really great interview. Everyone here should go and listen to it. Not you just don't mine. Know how much but that means yours. when when you compliment me, I was I was a little nervous interviewing you because I know you're a <laughs> podcast maven yourself, and I was like, ooh, he understands <laughs> the format. He understands the art. This is uh, yeah. Chris is like Alex is going to cry. It's, it's simple. Cry. You asked things you were genuinely curious about instead of a sort of templated list of of questions. So. Totally, totally. Well, um, in this discussion, we do have a couple questions um, that were sent in, a source from the team and all of that stuff, but it's going to be a similar thing. We can just kind of dive down the rabbit holes that we care to discuss. Awesome. Uh, what'd you have for breakfast today? Don't ask me questions that involve mem- memorizing, remembering things. I have two young children that are not sleeping and we just went through daylight savings. So <laughs> come on. Uh, what Isn't I have that amazing? Said, whatever, I'll say this, whatever my son didn't finish. <laughs> I, my so my memory is is very strange in that way in that like I rarely remember what I had for breakfast mm-hmm. today let mm-hmm. alone yesterday but then I'll have this crystal clear memory of of like six years ago having a conversation with somebody I'm like oh yeah you were wearing that shirt this was on the radio I'm like what the hell is that did you ask the breakfast question because it's a known thing that like public radio producers ask have I heard, heard Tim Ferriss say that once yeah but I don't so, so, totally understand why so to check the mics, check people's levels, you know, check the room, all that good stuff. A lot of times you need like a throwaway question that you'll actually record. And of course, it's not part of the show. And so you're sort of trained like the classic public radio producer, NPR producer is trained to ask their subjects, what do you have for breakfast? Because then they just start to talk in a way that seems natural. Hmm. And I've done most of my interviews, like the vast majority, you know, n- literally 95 plus percent virtually. And so I don't quite need that. But what I found, this is one of those geeky, creative things that I've fallen in love with over the years. Um, Asking a guest a throwaway question to check their levels is a great way not to engineer the tech, but to engineer them. So when I notice that, like, especially doing B2B shows, like an executive shows up and they're all stiff or, you know, they have a PR person in their ear or on the call. I've had that, too. I can tell, like, this is not going to break my way. I'm not going to get like a relaxed, beautiful conversation here. So I need to, before I start talking about something very serious, I need to ask these questions that will relax them, that will make them smile. Because you can hear it, even if you don't see it, you can hear the smile, you can hear the warmth. And so instead of saying, what do you have for breakfast? I'll say things like, do you have any, like, I'm just, Alex, I'm just going to check your levels really quick. I'm not going to use this in the final cut. Do you have any pets at home? I do. I have a a lovely dog that's uh, uh, looking out the window longingly right now. So like, look at Alex, right? You just went from a stoic face to smiling and you kind of moved your body a little bit like you warmed up. Or I'll say, Alex, what would be your last meal on earth? Right, right. I've talked a lot about that too. So if you want the answer, it's very complicated. Mine would be Sally's Pizza in New Haven. (laughs) How about you? So I'd I'd go for a comfort food as well. The first thought I had was like, oh, it's got to be ornate. It's got to be like like a, a wagyu ribeye with like a cheese, you know, like all of this stuff. Um, but then I'm like, you know, I would love like a cheeseburger, a bacon cheeseburger mm. with some like sweet potato fries and uh, sriracha aioli. Ooh, nice. Yeah, yeah a, cl- a close second for me would be a massive antipasto, a massive charcuterie. But yeah, these are questions that you ask somebody when you notice they're really stiff or you've heard them elsewhere and they're not like a great performer on the mic or on camera. So whether you're like shooting a doc like behind the scenes, you're off camera prompting people or you're doing one of these or you're on a podcast, like these questions are great for like <sighs> letting them relax because they start to smile and they're not thinking about work or not thinking about. And then you kind of like stay in that emotional plane and move from like last meal on earth to, you know, so I read somewhere that like you used to be like a diehard, like jujitsu hmm. 
per, I almost said performer. I don't even know what the, how would you describe practicer or whatever, uh, martial artist, yeah. right? Like, oh yeah, like, where did you come up with that? You stay in that emotional lane and get into the substance that way versus like, tell me about yourself or like going for the big, like the most important question. That is if the guest is not really casual or, or warm. So you're not engineering anything technical, you're engineering them. Yeah, you know, and depending on the format, I actually find that there are interesting insights in the seemingly mundane answers. For maybe like a business podcast like ours, it's not as important, although it could be for how people approach problems and their mental models. But with Tim Ferriss's, like I know he's kept those questions on in a couple of cases, at least in his old days. And yeah. somebody, I remember Seth Godin explaining his very meticulously set up breakfast that he eats the same thing every day. And it's like, he talked about his perfectly crafted cup of coffee, which he doesn't even drink coffee. He just mm -hmm. likes preparing it. And you're like, mm -hmm. oh, like I actually understand something about Seth Godin because of this very banal detail of his life or seemingly yes. banal detail of his life. Right. And I think that all matters. Like if you want an insight to stick, there's like a surrounding context you have to create. So it's not just enough to say like, Alex, what's your advice here? You know, like if, if there's more memorability to it, then you also, the, it's like a Trojan horse. Then inside of that is like the actual lesson that you impart. It's like if when a teacher is funny or something like that, or when they show you the car taking a tight turn at top speed, then they go, today we're going to learn about the force at play here, right? Instead of starting with the physics lesson, you know, that there's different ways to come at this, but it's all, it's all in the name of being more memorable. And I think that's, that's really important right now, especially in our world, because I think everybody's sort of over indexing and trying to be visible at the expense of being memorable. Mm. Well, that that's one kind of like theme. I think we call this like how to be remarkable in the age of AI. Yeah. And I think what you're also doing here is bringing out some sense of authenticity of like the human, you know, behind the answers instead of just like the scripts. And you have a lot of experience doing this. Like your, your podcast is, is heavily interview and story based. Like you do interviews, like a lot of your, like your books have a lot of these stories. So what other lessons other than this pre interview social engineering question <laughs> have you learned to get to that uh, maybe root level uh, of somebody's like real personality or real beliefs like what other yeah. tricks of the trade have you learned so you're talking if it's a guest driven or interview driven anything right text mm -hmm. multimedia. it doesn't even have to be something that you publish it could be you know a behind the scenes interview like if a new yorker writer is writing a piece they might interview five ten people and like mm -hmm. They're, they're still trying to pull those insights, right? Even if it's not going to be in raw format, like a podcast might be. Yeah. I mean, the big part is know the story you're trying to tell before you tell it. Know the thing, know the reason, the purpose that they're there for. You know, I'm, I'm writing a, like an essay for my newsletter tomorrow, which is about something called super stories. Just made up word that I created when I'm like, okay, this story can be told multiple ways and I can extract multiple different insights. So I don't need to find six different stories to bring this on the road with me when I show up at things like this or talk to my podcast listeners or write to my newsletter subscribers or tweet or post to LinkedIn. One story can have multiple variations with multiple insights, meaning it can resonate just as deeply in multiple mediums to multiple audiences. So like you act prolific, you appear prolific, but you know, it's like I have a small bag of stories. I just know how to mold them and shape them to be effective. Um, which I think is a, a superpower that like a lot of authors have. And I was fortunate to spend three straight years just focused on my speaking and, and my first book, um, which is kind of a weird privilege to have. And I want to try and extract lessons from that for, for all of us. So, okay. So super stories, that's where you're like, I'm going to arrive at this insight here. And I know that ahead of time. Therefore, as I tell Alex's story, I'm going to accentuate this detail I'm going to revisit or agitate this moment of tension or doubt or question on your mind as a listener or a reader, because I have to land the plane there, not there. Mm -hmm. But what I see from a lot of people is like a podcast is just an easy example for people right now. So let's just go with that. What I see is we generally explore this topic. And so we're going to talk to a lot of experts and the episode's purpose is you're an expert. Next on to the next what's far better, like we ask three questions for Unthinkable, which is my, my show. The three questions to plan this out is one, what is the story? So that's great. Like it's obvious, like, okay, like it's the story about Alex and his career or his wisdom about marketing. Two, why are we telling it? What is the topic, the theme? In other words, I'm enrolling you on a journey that I'm on and have been on personally and with this audience. So there's a purpose. I'm not just interviewing you because you're you. That's a big part of it. But I think you can shed light on this one important thing that relates to the overall premise of the show. 
And that's a missing piece for a lot of people in marketing is there's really no premise. It's just talking topics with experts. So that's the second question is, you know, what is the story? Why are we telling it? What's the topic? Um, you know, or what is it about? And then what does this reveal? So is there a hidden insight? It's not just like, here's proof. They did it. You can too. Here's an example. Here's a case study. It's an allegory more than a story. There's some kind of hidden meaning and you can reveal it. So you tell the story and then you say either these words or you approximate them in some way. You're like, all right, that's the thing about creating podcasts for brands. Uh, everybody thinks it's about the name of the guest when actually it's about the premise of the show, right? Like there's a reveal there. And so these are sort of the bones of creating something that feels differentiated that produces greater power to the work. Like, I think that's a huge gap for a lot of us. Like we often think about the volume of our content. We very rarely think about its power. But if you think about the purpose of content marketing, it's to create the least amount of content for the most amount of return for the highest possible impact for your audience and for you. And that's the theory of content marketing or the purpose of it. But what it devolves into is create the most amount of content, right? Like take the one original piece of crap and make 20 smaller pieces of crap, which is now just you smearing crap across the internet. Make one thing really, really good, right? And, and it'll have a greater impact and be easier to spread at the same time. Do you ever go into a story thinking you know the angle of the story and then come out realizing that it was a whole different story that Constantly. you discovered Constantly, like a uh, Hunter yeah. S Thompson. I was thinking about in fear and loathing. It's like ostensibly it was about like a, a mission from sports illustrated to cover some esoteric like racing event, but he ends up uncovering this whole um, portrayal of, of the kind of death of the American dream. Right. Yeah. It's like this whole deeper story that he stumbled into. Right. So I think about this all the time when I think about like structuring an episode or structuring a story that's written where like it's good to have a, a loose framework in mind. Like uh, again, just to keep get going down the podcast road for Unthinkable, we have a repeated rundown, you know, A block, C block, B block. We have a target runtime. We have a target purpose for all of these things because we're exploring what happens when you as a creative person and communicator um, trust yourself more than conventional thinking. Like when you interview someone like that, initially they seem to have done something unthinkable. So the first block of the show is we have to build up the best practice. When you're a podcaster in general, this is what it looks like. But Rishikesh Hirway of the podcast Song Exploder, which was our last episode, did this. And you're like, that's crazy. That's refreshing. That's unconventional. That's rebellious. I could never. That's, so that's B block. Here, like best practice is A block. Tear it down. It's unthinkable is B block. C block is, let's hear from him as to why it was really smart and strategic and even safe, or at least obvious, in his situation. And you go, huh, I see that. Maybe I should think like he does too in my work. Well, who is this guy? How did he get here? And then the fourth thing we do in D block is we talk about their backstory. Now, most shows without a plan, you start with the backstory. But that's not what we're exploring. We're not exploring general success. We're exploring this very specific premise and so the best way to illuminate that to people is to have a structure. Now, mm. given that structure, I'm heading in thinking, this is what Rishikesh can teach us. But as you talk to them, and, and like, this didn't happen in this episode's case, but it happens a lot. I'm like, oh, there's actually an entirely different lesson here. So I'm willing to like break from that rundown and try something new. Or when we plan episodes, we're like, hey, I know we have this rundown. What if we did it this way instead? So it's not, ju it's not just a container to tamp down your creativity, it's a way to focus it where you're like, I'm going to re-engineer off a base or with purpose. Um, like another analogy here is in public speaking, people go, I don't want to sound rehearsed. And I'm like, great, you have two choices. Don't rehearse at all and risk sounding sloppy and forgetting things and staring at your slides. You won't sound rehearsed, but you'll also be sloppy and ineffective or rehearse a ton because you'll internalize it to the point mm -hmm. where in the room you feel natural, you know all the moves. And you can also like improvise to the audience and the situation and, and all that good stuff. Like those are the options. And when you get caught in the middle, you're like, I, it feels rehearsed. I'm like, you haven't rehearsed enough, you know? So these things, these like the rigor overlaid onto the creative process is not meant to restrict you. It's meant to free you because it's just internalized. So now you can play and innovate. But I think everyone wants to get to that part first. And so what, what ends up happening is they get really sloppy. And so then what you get is, our podcast is raw and unedited. And I'm like, that is usually marketer speak for 
uh, a raw, what is it? What do they say? Raw and unfiltered, right? Which means bad and unedited, really. Mm-hmm. Um, but really good raw and unfiltered shows, there's usually some rigor behind it because they've planned the episodes or maybe the hosts are like professional entertainers. Yeah, just to pull back the curtain a little bit, I come off as like, I don't prepare a lot. Like my co-founders think that I don't prepare a lot for podcasts and whatnot, but I have this underlaying this this research process. I read all the books. I've got the kind of the, the way you described it. I'm coming in with the story and I kind of yeah. know enough to be comfortable to be able to improvise in that moment. So right. it is underpinning that confidence to improvise is a deep layer of constraints. Yeah. 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 I mean, like rigor is a, is a very defensible way to differentiate. It's I, I apply more rigor. Like people think that my show is massive and my newsletter is Matt and it's not, it's small. Um, but it, it's powerful. Like it reaches the right people. I'm very grateful. Like I worked really, really hard on it. It's a labor of love, but, um, because of the quality, the perceived quality of it, um, the perceived value of it, and hopefully the delivered quality and value, I think people go like, Oh, you might be onto something there. And like, I'll take you more seriously. I'll trust you quicker. I'll refer you to more people or I'll hire you for a higher priced, higher margin service or product. Um, you know, I always wonder like why we spend so much time and energy and effort, like twisting ourselves into knots for how to take something mediocre and market the hell out of it. Like scoop some of the time you took from trying to market the hell out of like a dud missile and like go build a better rocket. Cause that's a lot easier to get to orbit than you like taking a bunch of construction paper and tape and glue and like yeeting it into the sun. Mm. <laughs> like, it just makes no sense at all. Do you think that most people understand what mediocre versus great looks like? I feel like this is sometimes a matter of taste. It is like, this is where you get to the, like one of some of my favorite conversations, like over a bourbon, which is like, I want people to create quality content. What does quality (laughs) even mean? Um, Definitions, man, they're tough. It does matter. And like when you do the book writing thing, you do tend to visit those things. Like let's start at the definition. Let's start in the sciences. Like I'm talking about creative resonance. What is resonance in the sciences? Like you do weird things like that. But I think for our purposes, like to go back to work today, it's really important that we stop making these excuses. Like when I show up publicly and I'm like, we need to create quality things. People, what does quality even mean? Or like, yeah, but you can't, you you can't just like wait around for quality to happen. You got to go and ship your work. And I'm like, and no one said ship one thing a year. Like I didn't, I didn't say that, you know, I think the best realization that one can have is that quality and quantity sit on different spectra, which is, I feel like you've always held that point too. They're not the 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 same. Yep. It's not like an inherent trade-off between those. No, it's not. How do you get to quality? Like it's the Ira glass gap idea, which is when you start, you can envision better work than you can actually create. So the only way to close that gap is you ship a lot of work, but inherent in that idea from Ira glass The gap notion is you want to create quality. And what I see people doing is trying to let themselves off the hook for quality and going, well, what does it even mean? Or, ah, Mm. I got to, I have a persona or or, the deadline. It's like creativity is not about the amount of time and money you have. It's about given the constraints you have, how do you use them? Right? Five hours that you use, Alex, will seem more creative than five hours that somebody who doesn't give a damn uses. And so you have the intention for quality, you aspire to be great, but you ensure you're taking regular steps towards it. And I think that's the nuance that like a tweet or a LinkedIn bro post doesn't really reward, which is like, I'm not saying quality versus quantity, quality or quantity, ship a lot, ship it, just ship it. What I'm saying is like, you need a cadence, you need a practice that's either your own or for work. You need to do a lot of quantity, but also really deeply care about quality. So the best sort of like definitional, like focusing function I've come up with here is creativity equals repetition plus reinvention over time. So you do a thing as best as you can today, right? Given your constraints, given your deadlines, it's not perfectionistic. That's not what we mean by quality, right? That's just some people who hide behind the word quality. What they're really doing is they're being perfectionist. They're declaring it Mm -hmm. because it's quality concerned. No. Um, doesn't count if it doesn't ship. So it's a rep. I did a thing. I shipped it. It's reflection on that rep. It's reinvention. It's looking for ways to improve because how did it make you feel? How did it make others feel? And then you do it again, slightly differently or better over time. You do it again and again and again. So it all unfolds through the quantity. That's how you get to quality. You can't separate them. 
you, that's the playing of the scales like, for a musician. Yourself. That's the repetition that's required to build the technical yeah. expertise to yeah. be able to capitalize on the vision that is the song in your head. Right, right. But first, but, you like, need to care a about how good that, that song happens is. Of like, oh, how dare you suggest we create quality? Because now you're suggesting that we don't create a damn thing. I'm like, no, I'm suggesting you create a lot of things, but care a lot too. Oh, I think that's the piece too. Like I've written about this before and there was just a Twitter question. It's like, what do you look for when you hire writers? Mm. And the number one thing is they got to write. Well, like obviously that's table stakes, but the other thing is they have to give a shit about what they're writing about. And that's something that I haven't found a way to tangibly describe what that means, but it's something mm. that to me is just eminently readable in the piece in how yeah. they talk about what they're ta- writing about. Right. It's, it's something that you, you can't really train, but like that to me is like the internal barometer of quality versus you could say like you could take a bunch of external you know feedback how it's resonating how it's converting there's all these market indicators but like sure. at the core there's something internal that says i actually really care about this yeah and you can you may not, i mean i think i'd argue you can train it but lest we go down a rabbit hole that's even bigger than the one we're down now let's say we we want to vet it we want to talk to marketers writers producers creatives of some kind and see like so are they going to be able to produce so effortlessly at a high level you know, whether you define that as a lot of quantity and quality or whatever, you can tease that out from people. So like interview questions are important. Like, yes, receive samples or assign work, pay them if you assign work. But like one of my favorite questions to ask is I I call it the big bag of money question, which is so like I led the content team at HubSpot very briefly or a startup for a few years um, or I've hired a lot of freelance writers. And I always want, yes, I I just, I'm trying to discern something from their written piece. But then when I talk to them, I say, Assume for a moment, like magical scenario, that I could give you two years worth of money, way more than you need to live, like covers all your expenses, your savings, your dream vacations, all of it. But to get this money for two straight years, you have to agree that you won't take any other jobs and you'll write a blog. And that blog can be about anything you want, anything at all. What would it be about? And what I want is not a specific answer. Like the worst answers, which I've gotten before is like, what, like they're applying to a HubSpot, you know, content marketing job. Or when I worked in VC, like they were talking about start, I would write about the startup economy. I'd write about SEO. I'm like, all due respect. No, you would not. (laughs) Um, What would you actually write about? What I wanted to see was not the correct answer. What I wanted to see was this initial like moment of lighting up where they were like, oh, this is the dream project I've been waiting for. Even Mm -hmm. if they were like, you know what? I wouldn't be a blogger. I'd be a podcaster or a YouTuber or whatever. Like, I want to see the motivation to make this intrinsic desire to just create amazing stuff that they love and others love. And if I didn't see that, I would try and chip away a little bit to reach it because maybe they're just stiff in the interview Mm -hmm. situation. or just trying to give you the answer you want. Yeah, I'm going to give them multiple attempts at that. But that first foray is does this person have this intrinsic desire to create content? Because there are some people right now, lots of them, who are gaining lots of followers, but almost no influence. Like social Mm. media companies have driven that pretty far apart. And what I want to see is that you're not going to ditch writing if some marketing guru said, hey, you know what's working better than writing content is um, leaping out of the bushes next to your prospects' homes and saying, surprise, with like your logo on your chest. Look, it's actually driving business. If you're the kind of person that's like, oh, okay, I'll do that instead. That's not the writer that I want. You know, yeah. these are not the marketers you're looking for. I want the people who are like, I found the overlap of the thing I am called to do and the thing that is happening here in marketing. I have an intrinsic motivation to make. So like we, I see this all the time on Twitter and LinkedIn now, like you see like these different formats and these trends rise up. It's mm-hmm. like somebody figures mm-hmm. out how to game the algorithm or like somebody's probably teaching a course on this, but I'll look at somebody's Twitter profile and it's like formulaic. It's like the blank guy. And then it'll have a couple emojis. My favorite is when it's in quotes. Like yeah, it's always in quotes. That. No one, no one. I don't understand it. No one. But like they'll that. do the same Twitter threads and the same carousels and you see yes. it picking up steam. Yep. So are you never tempted to just be like, all right, I can take my content and put, I'll play the game. It's clearly working for people. 
I don't know. Like, like sometimes I'm like, maybe I'll just make some link LinkedIn carousels. Maybe I'll yeah. I, I I think what that does is in view of pe- so um, Tom Webster is I think one of the best researchers on the planet. He started with or didn't start, but for many years he was known as the SVP of research at Edison Research, and he focused on audio and specifically podcasting. And now he's uh, a part of an organization called Sounds Profitable. So that that's Tom Webster. Um, you know, a, a relatively l- successful person in the marketing world. Um, Tom talks about non-response bias. That's where there's a group of people that you're not hearing from that is actually informing or muddying the data that you hear or that you get. I think more content marketers, social media folks, like I think we need to be hyper aware that there is that phenomenon of non-response bias where like, look, a thousand people really engaged with this basic, hollow, maybe even a little sleazy whatever that I posted. And I'm saying like, but what about the people that didn't respond? The people that are more discerning, more Mm. experienced, more influential, see through what you're doing, really aren't going to pay much attention to your work. So the only way to impress or win their trust is eventually when you have like massive followers and you're all over the place, they go, oh, I respect you not for what you're saying, but for the fact that you have a successful business or big following, right? But in the meantime, until you hit the lottery, you're actually pushing people away. So rather than go for the lowest common denominator, what if we made content for the most influential numerators? And that doesn't mean the people with the biggest followings. That just means in your situation, in your niche for your goals, who are the influencers or who are the influencers who influence the influencers? Like as Drew Davis says, they're the micro influencers, the people that the big names with big followings actually learn from. Mm -hmm. What if one out of a hundred instead of a hundred out of a hundred was success? Who would that person be? Well, in B2B, that'd be the CEO, the CMO, the person who's making the buying decision, right? I think a lot of the tactics, a lot of the work done on social media to grow a following actually diminishes, doesn't just sit apart from influences, influence, but diminishes your influence because the folks with the most influence are looking at that. I'm not talking about social media followings. I'm talking about like actual market influence. They're looking at that going, gross, yep. or at least not for me. That person's not for me. You know, my, my, my wife is a professor and a psycho, uh, psychology researcher. She has two classes she teaches. One is an entry level class and the other is for like juniors and seniors and, you know, people with the major. Guess which class is huge? 101. Like if you just want the biggest following, that's what you do. 101. Guess who doesn't need 101? The executives. Right. Uh, I got to admit a while back, I think it was a year ago, I tried to hire a LinkedIn content agency. Uh, I have all these blog posts that I've written. So they actually tried to repurpose a lot of what I had already done, but it was in a very uh, spammy format. <laughs> I mean, mm-hmm. They did what they did well. Uh, so I can't knock them for that. I walked into like, the interview. Enter, enter. Uh, yeah. I couldn't like, leave what I found. That enter, type of enter. Stuff. And like, you know, it like, was a chair. Here's a free template, like comment, like, and share for like access. And it was like emojis and all that stuff. And it was getting a ton of traction. Like they were getting way more impressions than I had ever gotten. But I actually, I, I was talking to Pep, uh, I think at one of our meetups and he's like, Hey man, you should stop doing those. Like it's not your voice. And I don't think that the VP of marketing who you want to reach is resonating with that. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. yeah, you're right. Like, cause that's like the way you described it. Was it non-response bias? Non-response bias. So that's exactly, I, I didn't have a word for it, but I was like, I'm getting a hundred thousand versus a thousand, like or 10,000 or whatever that order of magnitude is difference in impressions. But I, I looked and it, it wasn't the people that I wanted to reach, you know? Yes. Yeah. So that was a, a big learning for me. Yeah. Like just reset all the way to the like most extreme, in some cases, dream scenario, not dream for me. Cause I just like making things too much, but dream for some people. What if you only had to create one piece of content? And it only had to reach one person. And then you were done. (laughs) Like, what if that was the case? Would that be better than creating infinite content that feels like you're on the hamster wheel and trying to reach infinite? It's like, unless it has a million associated with it, marketers can't stand proudly behind it, right? It could always be better or have more for reasons. But like, what if the other extreme were true? I think most people would be like, that'd be pretty awesome. Like, what a return on investment in that piece of content, right? I created one thing. It was read by one person. And now all these buyers are coming my way. All this influence is coming my way. All this trust has been earned just because of that. I I say, yes, we'd probably want that. 
Okay, so we should probably start on that end of the spectrum and see how close we can get. But instead, what we're doing is we're just chickens with our heads cut off, sometimes through no fault of our own, most times, right? Because we serve multiple stakeholders. A great example is every content team I've ever led before in-house. It's been years, like seven or eight years now. But when I was in-house managing content teams, I was acutely aware that like my job was to beat back peers who thought of my writers as buttons they wish they could push and out came a blog post. Guess mm -hmm. what? Someone invented a button you can push and out comes lots and lots of content, blog posts included. And so what do you see is you see the gorging on that desire, that base desire, because people think it's about content. It's not. I am a content creator. I love this stuff. I'm a writer. I'm a podcaster. I'm a speaker. This is what I do. And even I'm admitting it's not about content. That's not the job. The content is to create connection. That's actually the job, right? Do that. Focus on that. The content should be informed by that end, end result. That's the only goal that really matters for us. Right. So you you would say you're pretty anti just like churn out a bunch of chat GPT content. That's a fair assumption. One may say that. One <laughs> may say that. Although I will say that like I saw, a, a, so I run a membership community, which is about pushing yourself creatively um, called the Creator Kitchen. And we're, we're launching it next month in April uh, to publicly. We have some private members right now. And we, we're testing out this format called Creator Roundtables, which is like an actor's roundtable, but for us. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Five or six of us, really honest, really no, no audience, talking shop, big ideas and small. Everything's welcome. We're all peers around the content table, around the Creator Roundtable. Um, and today, like a couple hours ago, one of our members who is a, a coach and a photographer and, and a writer, he was saying, you know, I, I use these tools, these AI tools. And I hadn't summed it up to my friends as to why. And he found a tweet. And I wish I could cite who said it because I thought it was a smart take, which was basically uh, people who don't think chat GPT is, is useful haven't learned how to use it well. People who think chat GPT created content is good haven't learned to write well. Mm, I think I saw that tweet. Yeah. I thought that was really well said. I would agree with that. Um, I have two diversions, <laughs> just forgive me, but I just caught up on the recent uh, season of South Park and they did a whole episode on chat GPT where um, Stan is dealing with troubles with his girlfriend because <laughs> he won't respond. He just thumbs up everything. <laughs> and meanwhile, I think it was Clyde's girlfriend was like, oh my God, he's so nice now. Like he's just responding with these really amazing responses. And he'd been using <laughs> chat GPT and then all of a sudden everybody learns about it. So then like they're doing it for their essays but then yeah. the teacher's like you know i'm using it to like prompt the essays and grade the essays right and all of a sudden it was just a bunch of robots talking to each other and i feel like that is some sometimes the case with this this um, generative ai world it's yeah. like i don't know I, I also read that you know everybody wants to create ai content but nobody would admit that they want to read ai content that's fair that's i like that take too i have only one hard line with this which is don't outsource your imagination like, I don't care how you get to the point where you publish high integrity, deeply resonant work. As long as you do, that's mm -hmm. the job. Create connection, earn trust, spark action. You know, that's the job. And so if you're going to use more of these tools or less, it, it, I, I don't care. The hard line I take is don't outsource your imagination. If you need to unblock it, fine. Don't outsource it. Like if you start acting like a, like that's, that's really the punchline to all this is I'm not concerned about creators um, being replaced by bots. I'm concerned about creators acting like bots, mm. right? They're doing things that don't uniquely require them and over and over and over again. And if you are doing things that don't require you pretty soon, you're not going to be required. So if you can imbue your work with things that make it feel like you, AI is your intern, have at it. It's your assistant. If you do things that pretty much anybody could do in your space, AI is your replacement, like be worried. And, and I think that comes from a place of over-indexing our learning uh, or maybe our interpretation of like mastery of craft on one thing. Like take stories as an example. How do you become a masterful storyteller? Well, a lot of us think about process, storytelling techniques and all these externalized ideas. It's like pro like story has become to marketers the, the same thing that like Instagram ads are. It's like a tactic. It's a checklist. It's a thing we add on or follow a checklist for. It's process. But there's two other pieces to mastery, which is your posture and your practice. Like the posture is your creative fingerprints, right? It's like your vision. It's your messy bag of humanity. It's all the things that make you you that you can dip into and use to get your creative fingerprints all over the work. That's now urgent. And also no LLM sucks that up. Like 
I was walking the other day uh, and I observed something in the world and that's now a powerful metaphor in my work. I was the only one that ha had access to that. I could only mm -hmm. use that. And that's just one of a very big list of things that makes you who you are. Use it. It's now imperative. It's not just, I hope this improves the work. I hope I can influence it. No, you do. So learn how to proactively. So that's your posture. And then your practice is simply, you've done the work. You've put in the reps. You've put yourself on a deadline. You've shipped a lot of things. And it's in the practice that we find ourselves, that we learn to improve our posture and then develop a process that suits us instead of someone else's system or structure or approach. But we're so over-indexed on learning process, often at the expense of posture and practice, that we're like a lot of people are worried. And I, I think maybe in some cases, deservedly so. But in most cases, no, there's plenty of stuff that you can uniquely do and, and now should learn how to do. So I think you, you hit on probably, in my opinion, the most important point for our whole theme about how to be remarkable in the age of AI, which is posture. Is I think what AI can functionally do and maybe it'll do this better in the future, but it can do it now in certain parts is improve the process. Like you can incorporate that to maybe speed up things that had taken you more time, bounce around ideas, get the creative juices flowing. But posture is one thing. And I, I think you may have said this in your blog post. It might've been on our podcast, but the who behind the content being yes. more and more important. Yeah. So I, I would love if you could dive into more about that posture, how to develop that, how to stand out as somebody who resonates and not just the content you create, but the person behind it, like how do you create that resonance in 2023? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm very confused by the fact that some people would say part of my job or all of it is creating content professionally, um, which is like saying part of my job is to be a professional basketball player. And then the creator has no practice, has never tested and tinkered and learned and improved. It's just using the game to try and improve. Um, you know, the story of my career is not what you find on LinkedIn. The story of my career is writing a sports blog on the side for many years, just for fun, turning that into a blog about a specific team, then moving to talk about sports blogging as a niche, and then writing a Tumblr that nobody read about marketing, then creating a, a call-in vent line about marketing BS that nobody called, but I still built. Like creating things because I want to get better. I want to discover what is the right approach here? How does this feel? You know, it's like trying things on for size, both in general, trying to get better at something, but also in the minutia of one piece and how to make micro decisions. It's always like trial and error, learning, adjusting, little tinkering here and there. And then suddenly you look back and you're like, I've done a lot. Or somebody looks at you and declares you to be good at what you do. And you're like, I, I guess, I don't know. I've just, I've just done it a lot. Um, I think if, if an alien species came to this planet and analyzed our creative heroes, somehow magically like scanning the person and they have access to everything that person ever drafted or shipped in their lives, that alien would only conclude of all these legendary creative people, they're really bad at this. Hmm. You know, like every film, every musician, every podcaster, every writer, every, every craft person is sitting atop a mountain of crap that they had to cre create, draft, kill, etc., to create like a couple of gems. Mm. And what we're trying to do in marketing is just make the gems. And I'm like, that's just not, it's just not realistic. So where do you find your posture? I hope you are irrationally, usefully self-delusional like I am. And you're like, I can do that. But if you're not, and even if you are, all these things about applying who you are and bringing that out in your work, it happens in the doing. Like it doesn't, inspiration isn't just going to hit you. And like, now it's, I'm a brilliant creator today. It's like, no, 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 it's Friday. And on Fridays we ship. I like, I, I think I said this on your podcast, you but did. like I started to joke that the whole mean girls thing, like on Wednesdays, we wear pink. Why? I don't know. I guess because it's Wednesday on Fridays. I ship. Why? It's not because I feel great. It's not because I'm inspired. It's not because this is genius. It's not because I know this will drive a result or go viral. It's not because some guru told me to do it It's because it's Friday. And on Fridays I ship. Like that is, I want us to have a mean girls attitude about our craft, about the practice, because within the mucking around, you find yourself. And where I get concerned is people go, we can all be editors. We can skip the mucking around, right? Just, just skip it entirely. And the people who use these tools, well, they're just guiding the mess. They're just like, it's like an assistant in a store trying on the clothes, right? They're still taking the shirt and seeing how it fits. They're not like, great, thanks for the shirt. I'll leave the store now. Because in the doing, in the practice is where you find all these powerful things that if you admire anybody, if you like any of my work, I'd point to those things and go, that was built. That was found in the mucking around, in the mess, in the draft. That's in the minutia, right? 
And like part of my mission is I just want people not only to see that, but to love that. You know, I want to look to my left and my right and see a listener or a reader or someone who bought my book or whatever, someone from this event who's like hacking away in the mud in the messy jungle. And I look at them and they have like their hair is a mess and they're sweating, but they give me a big smile. And I see like a little dead bug on their teeth, right? But they're so happy to be swinging away at that jungle. Like that's what I want um, because that's where the good stuff is built and, and found. So that's when I say don't outsource your imagination, that's really what I mean is don't skip that part because that's where you learn about yourself and learn to deploy the best of you to make the work more irreplaceable and to make you irreplaceable in this world of very commodified content. That was beautiful. I have two directions that I want this to go and I'm going to, so one on posture and one on uh, practice. And the first one is is more of a point on practice, but I used to be pretty, um, not anti, but a little bit anti content calendar because I felt like there was a lot of things that content teams that would do mm-hmm. that felt like work, but wasn't, it was kind of procrastinating the actual yeah, work. Yeah, like, oh, holes or meeting. Yeah, like why would you publish meeting. this today if you could do it yesterday or like, you know, like it, it just seemed a little arbitrary. But then I started doing more content production myself and keeping myself to higher standards with regards to how much I ship which is literally, it's like I ship on Tuesdays, I ship on Thursdays. And I made a little content calendar for myself that was like, all right, I'm going to ship a blog post on these days to my personal mm-hmm. site, a blog post to the Omniscient blog on on these days, and these LinkedIn posts. And it's like, they're not all good, but it, it sits me, like I'm not pr- you know, producing me- mediocrity, like not on purpose anyway, but I just know not everything's well, going to resonate. You will, like you will, you right. know, but you're not It's, the it's not like I'm setting that. out to just yeah. throw a, a bunch of shit out there. Right. I'm, I'm trying to do good stuff. And I found that, like, one, I'm improving in my writing capability. Mm-hmm. Uh, my co-founder, Ali, always talks about this this phrase around, like, the faucet running. It's like, if, if it hasn't run for a while, it takes a little to get the gunk out. But if it's been running consistently, you sit down and, like, it flows a lot easier. So I found that's one yeah. thing. And yeah. the creative, so you talked about constraints earlier with right. regards to, like, the discipline. I found it allows me to invoke a lot more creativity in the actual work that I'm doing. I love as that. opposed to thinking, like, oh, like, what am I going to write today? And then... You know, I don't publish anything for four weeks and then get inspired and publish a bunch. That's genius, man. It was all over the place. So I'm pretty pro content calendar now. The, the, the phrase, and what, however you get there, content calendar, pithy phrases, like the mean girls thing, whatever gets you going. Um, one of the members in the kitchen is, his name is Sam Sager. He's actually, he's a content creator. He's a podcaster and a writer, but he's also a fitness trainer. And so, but he's got this approach called intuitive fitness, which means like, you know, if you're like I am, uh, if you love playing basketball, you know, I'm, I need to do this. I want to, we bought a house a year and a half ago, finally have a driveway after leaving the city. I want to buy a basketball hoop. So yes, I can have some fun, but also intuitively that's going to give me more momentum towards being fit in general. Right. And not necessarily like going to the gym or getting on the exercise bike. It's like leaning into what feels intuitive to you is an important first step. And so he's got a name for overall, not just with fitness and intuitive fitness, like what these systems are called, which is great. Self-renewing. So my self-renewing process, in other words, I am able to prevent problems in my creative work before they happen, like writer's block, because I have a self-renewing system. Like I know my mission. I know the premise of my newsletter. I know the premise of my show. I have an apparatus and a system to collect ideas and vet them and publish them. And then I have a deadline, right? It's a self-renewing system. So I'm never wondering, what do I ship? I'm never stuck with writer's block. And at the risk of becoming too spicy in the take here. If you don't have like a traumatic brain injury, you don't have writer's block Mm. because you just responded to tell me why you have writer's block. So you can clearly write. Okay. So what trick are you trying to play? You have brilliance block. That's what you're saying. And so like, fine, don't try to be brilliant. Just try to write because you can do that. Write anything, throw it away, fix it. Just write. Um, no one actually has a writer's block. You say you have writer's block. What you mean is you have brilliance block. How do you prevent that feeling is you have a self renewing momentum growing, always shipping, always improving practice. Like it's not a panacea. There is no silver bullet to solve all our ails, but if you want to create content at a high level, it's damn close. Uh, yo, also on writer's block, I just want to say real quick, I think that is one cool use case of AI because it is a, pr- a form of perfectionism. Like I, I've had it where I'm looking at a blank page and I'm like, oh, the first line's got to be fire. But then like I started just like typing stuff into ChatGPT or Jasper and I'm like, this is bad. I can do this better. You know, and then, then I think about what I actually wanted to say and then I'll just like, I, it's almost like I'm using it as like a debate partner or a sparring partner because yeah. it gets something on the page. And now I'm like, oh, I can do that better. 
Right. Whatever, whatever gets you going, but you have that North star, which is like better. All right. Not, no, no I'm done. And you have moments oh, like that. It. Right. But you're well, like, no, this LinkedIn. is the, the same member of the, of the creator kitchen who pointed me to that awesome tweet from before. He was saying like, I use this to establish what's like a, a very low quality baseline. If I were mm-hmm. going to write about this and then this is what chat GPT gives me. He's like, that's like the below average version. And I want to take it as far up here as I can get. And I was like, that's another great way to look at it. You know, there's all these ways to look at it. I think just what you're seeing publicly is a bunch of ad networks that we, for some reason, call social networks, rewarding the most sensational, pithy, extreme content to create more ad inventory. Like, that's all. Like, when you're great at social media, you're like, I'm great at creating free ad inventory for a company that I don't work for. Right. Like, so we should take with a salt factory, not even a grain of salt, a salt <laughs> mine. Where does salt come from? I think I there's know. salt mines. Doesn't yeah, it no, it is, I think it's a salt mine. Um, I'm, I'm fairly <laughs> certain it's a salt mine, but I don't think what we should be taking our cues from is this stuff spreading on social media as it relates to these AI tools. I think what we should be looking for are who are the artisans that we admire who are creating at a higher level than us? What have they done? What is their behavior, their skill set like? And can I mimic that on my own? Like, oh, they have a recurring practice. Okay, can I do that alone? Or do I need an assistant? Do I need a helper, right? What am I trying to do? Where am I trying to go? What skills do I want to develop? And then you decide, is this the tool I use? Maybe not, right? Like, it's okay. It's okay not to use the tool. It's okay to use the tool. It's about the outcome, which is that connection with an audience. Mm -hmm. So on the other point I wanted to ask you is more on the posture side. Um, I recently wrote a little newsletter segment on, I, I read this article called The Perils of Niching Down. Hmm. Which to me resonated because I have a background in experimentation and conversion optimization. I'm just as comfortable in R as as I am in Google Doc writing uh, an essay. Cool. And I've got this whole bookshelf full of just esoteric books from like evolutionary biology to statistics and all of these different things. And I've actually tried to invoke that in the content that I put out. It's always been very hard for me to say like I am the quote the blank guy, whatever <laughs> whatever that is. And it seems so what you had mentioned that that provoked this thought is you're like, you didn't see, you see me now, but you didn't see me writing the sports blog on the side and all of these different things that have kind of culminated in who I am today. So what, what are your thoughts on like, quote unquote, niching down versus maybe more of a composite or like a quilt of a person? It's a couple ways to come at that. So one is it's, it's 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 too general for me to declare yay for niching down or no. Um, but one is that what I see is some creative people, they find one horse that works, that rides well on social media and they just ride it, right? It's like that comedian that does that one thing over and over and over and over and over again. And you're arbitraging an opportunity. You're hoping I'm going to, I'm going to run this dry and then I got to find my next thing. It's and like I think what it forces wonder. you to do is it forces you to beat something to death rather than explore. Like it's not very sturdy or defensible. You're just saying like, I'm just going to push my pain further out. But in the meantime, I'm going to enjoy some riches. Um, If that's who you are, fine. I think there's two types of marketers. There's arbitrage and affinity. Arbitrage is like, that's a near-term opportunity. I can get in cheap before I have to be good, before I have to understand this, before I have to explore. I can just be or be loud because I'm early. And I will do that until people come with higher integrity or at least just higher quality or more creativity. And then I have to go on to the next thing, right? You know, I've got to strip this until I can strip it no longer and I got to move. That's arbitraging. Um, Then you have affinity, which is like everywhere I show up, like Taylor Swift could launch a podcast where she just reads a dictionary definition every day and it would have a million downloads immediately, right? Because people are like, Taylor, uh, Taylor, right? It's Tay-Tay reading the dictionary. This is amazing. Like, let's go listen. You know, like that's, that's affinity where there's this trust built up over time. There's this depth of connection that you feel, even if it's parasocial um, and therefore one way. But affinity is much more in line with my philosophy. And so niching down, if it helps you earn affinity, fantastic. But the purpose of niching down is not to be the only game in town or find white space. It's to set up useful friction. And there's other ways to do that. So like useful friction says, you're potentially a fit. Oh, but this, for this reason, you won't be a fit. And I want to lead with that. So you get out of my system and I don't Mm -hmm. waste your time or mine 
on serving you with content, on false data that I don't need, uh, you know, on even spending time, you know, talking to you if it's a sales call or, you know, a community forum or something like that. Like I want the poor leads out of my system and I want the great leads, the great customers, the great evangelists to come sprinting into my corner and be fully there with me. So you can do that a number of ways. I am for this very niche or I am for this belief system. Right? You start instead of demographics, you start focusing on psychographics. You lead with your strongest beliefs. So, like making podcasts for brands as I have, I started seeing better leads come in and started like really enjoying it more, quite frankly. And, and also closing things a lot faster when I had two sources of friction, which may seem like niching down, but my niche was B2B, you know, that's pretty mm-hmm. broad. Or maybe B2B podcast, which is still pretty broad. But all over the website where I would advertise these services. I would put up my beliefs. Like, this is what I think a podcast is. A podcast is not an audio blog. It is not good for net new audience at all. It's good for activating and deepening trust with existing audience. If you want to grow your downloads or grow it quickly, if you want to launch six episodes to prove this out, we got to make sure what we're looking for is depth of connection, not total spread, because that's not what this is for. It's not what it'll ever be for. And it's not what it's going to be for during our test period. If you want to do a parade of experts, if your goal is just to connect with the guest, if your goal is to say, I want to have the Tim Ferriss show of my space, we're not a good fit because the world doesn't need yet another generic talking topics with experts type of show. I develop premise led IP driven shows. And here's all the things those are good for, right? And if you're like reading this and you're like, well, this doesn't make any sense at all. We're like, nope, the boss wants it a different way. No worries. I wish you a ton of luck, but we're going to be that fit. You know, so and then on the sales call, I'm gut checking that. So basically what I'm doing is you're coming to me saying, I want a podcast because I'm a B2B brand or an author. And I'm like, I'd love to talk talk you out of this. And if you get through that friction, we're amazing fits. And not only do I enjoy the work more, but I have to spend less time like convincing both pre-sale and post. Um, so that's like the power of niching down. It's just one way to essentially create up use, create useful friction for your brand. Mm -hmm. What makes you so passionate about empowering creatives and creativity? I'm addicted to the feeling and I want, I want, I want to be like, just, did you, did I, this is me, you feel it. I feel you, you, yeah, you same Spider-Man, right? Like it's just the Spider-Man meme. It's same. Um, I'm incredibly privileged. I grew up First of all, when I was born, the door was slightly ajar already, if not wide open. Two very loving parents. I am white, straight, cisgendered in upper middle class Connecticut. All the opportunity in the world was handed to me. So like, not only do I love what I do, but I feel obligated to share what I do, like the meta of it. Like, here's my show and here's helpfulness to go make your own. Um, You know, like sitting here going like, yeah, imposter syndrome, maybe writer's block, never. Like, that's a very privileged thing to say. Um, and so I want to help push people through those barriers or help them wrestle their maker monsters because I had wonderful supporting people all my life with, through no fault of my own, right? The, mo- the moment I was born. So part of it's that. Um, but honestly, a lot of it is this, the, the well just gets ever deeper. Like the more I make stuff, the more I'm like, there's more here. And, you know, I'm kind of like a little kid running around. Like if you just like let loose my four-year-old daughter into a children's museum, she's going to like just sprint around being like, did you see this? It's amazing. Did you see this? This is amazing. And then I get into marketing and everyone's like, so we're going to create some content because we have to drive a lead and it's going to sound like this. And here's a tool so you can skip the whole process. And then, uh, yeah. And then we're going to go, you know, or you get like hucksters and spammers and charlatans shouting at you about doing it their way. And I'm like, see it this way. Like you'll enjoy it. They'll enjoy it. You'll benefit. They'll benefit. Like there's an amazing way to do this. And it's, it's addicting, right? I just love that feeling. And so I want others to feel it too. And so the idea that I'm able to turn on some light bulbs, even before mm-hmm. I'm able to like walk them around the room, that drives me. Like that is my mission is to help people make what matters because there's a lot of people who want to and, and they're not yet. How, can, this might be tough, but can you describe that feeling that you're trying to replicate and share? That spark, that light yeah, bulb? very easily. I can use yeah. a metric. It's not a metric that anybody here is going to proudly go and declare that they're measuring to their boss, but it's a metric that's drive. Uh, it, it drives me every day. So we're in marketing. So we need an acronym. So CPP. CPP is the metric. Cackles per piece. I'm alone <laughs> in my office and I find, I don't know, a music track for an episode of my podcast. And 
the music, the bass drops right as the action hits of the story. Or there's like a little moment where I can cut the music right as like this word is emphasizer. Like there's these little tiny things or I'm writing and I'm like, oh, this will be a good callback for the end of the piece. And I stuck the landing. There's these tiny little moments, which is where I think creativity unfolds where I'm alone and I'm seeing it and I'm anticipating how you're going to see it or feel it. And I'm just laughing. I'm cackling to myself. So CPP, when I notice those things, I'm like, this, I'm alone, literally in this office right now, I'm alone. And I'm looking around like this, do you, this is great. Oh, I'm alone. Right. <laughs> and like, so I want you to experience that. And if you are fantastic, like don't, you don't need my work, uh, but if you want to keep pushing yourself creatively, that that's what I'm about. And I think like we can all do that all the time because look at how much there is to explore. And some people see that work. They see the work of those that they admire and they go, ah, I could never. And I want you to go, what if I made that right to, to elevate your gaze instead of lower it and be like, I'm only in marketing. So I am at the little kid's table of creativity on the internet and I have to do it this way. Right. I think we can aspire to more. So yeah, CPP. That is a cool way to describe it. I, for me, like I definitely resonate with that, but for me, it, it's always felt like a click of sorts. So it's like a flow state. It, it's kind of in the production process when things feel less self-conscious. Like I, I can feel it when the words are going on the page without me really thinking about the words. Yeah, It's like when you're dancing with somebody and you all of a sudden like sync up and you're like in the same sphere. Like it's, it's intuitive and it's like, oh, we're on the same page. Like there's, there's this like click. Well, if anyone's seen Pixar's soul, right, when he's playing the piano and he's just lifted to an ephemeral plane, right, because he's in that flow state, that's where it's very harmonious. And, you know, I, I was watching clips, pe uh, people were sharing clips from the Adobe Summit the other day, and uh, Aaron Sorkin was on stage, like, kind of being very, like, what am I doing here? Who are you people? Uh, but he was talking about, like, he was asked about, like, chat GPT or like focusing on the audience. And he's like, listen, if you just asked yourself, what is the most effective way to make beef, to prepare a dish involving beef that the most possible people will love, everybody would make a McDonald's hamburger every time. He's like, what I'm trying to do is create things I like and that my friends like, and then cross my fingers that enough other people like it, that I get to keep doing it. And it sounds really silly to say, but at the core of all my work is I want you to create work that feels more like you because I think that's wonderful for business and all the aims therein, but mostly it's because you get to create the things that you wish existed. And I know this sounds trite, but like, we're going to die someday. If you want to do that, when are you going to do that? So I don't think we can wait. I don't think it all can happen like in some magical retirement scenario. I think it's like, can we get closer to in our work, making the things that we wish existed? And be able to put our names to it and go to bed at night being like, that was really satisfying. That was beautiful. Um, I'm getting the call that we have to wrap up shortly. Mm. And I don't, I don't even want to ask another question. I mean, I do want to talk to you forever, but like, <laughs> <laughs> that was such a great way to wrap things up. So uh, it's like you planned it. Um, <laughs> do you want to promote anything? Yeah. Um, so you have this thing called the internet, which allows you to make anything whenever you want for free. And there's something you're thinking about going, I always wish I could make that. So um, rather than pick up anything I'm doing, just go make that. And if you need to report back and be like, Jay, I saw you speak at this thing. And I, you told me not to like listen to your show. And then like, I went and made this thing. Great. My job is done. Like, forget the stuff I make, go make your own stuff. Hell yeah, man. Thank you so much. This was awesome. This was a lot of fun. Thank you. I really appreciate it. 